Well, hello. Well, welcome to the uh, Halloween edition of my live stream for today. Um, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, doing some Halloween themed animation and I'm working on some Halloween themed animation. Halloween's one of my favorite times of year because of all the colors and the lights and the costumes and just the general wackiness of it so uh, I'm always really excited about this. I've got some friends over here to the right if you can see that. Um, they're going to be joining me just for a little bit but uh, we'll get started drawing here pretty soon. Just want to make sure as always that things are working properly. You can see, you can hear and so hello Rushback, hello Vaporina, Vaporina. <laughs> 666. I think I know you. <laughs> I think I know who you are. Um, but uh, welcome to another edition of Livestream Madness. Yes, I thought that's who it was. Welcome, Charlotte. Hopefully, you, you appreciate the uh, new friend that I added um, since you've seen Jack dancing. <laughs> Why, thank you, Renato. You've never seen this before, have you? I had another picture behind, but uh, it's gone. So I'm still working on this. Uh, throughout the week as we lead into the Halloween time. But anyway, these are my two friends who are going to be joining us. Um, well, actually, they're just going to be here for a little while while I'm getting started talking about uh, what we're going to do today or what I'm going to be doing today. And what that is, is I'm going to be animating a little bat, a little piece of bat animation that I uh, started uh, just for fun and uh, the idea was just to do something that's quick and down and dirty um, i've been doing a lot of cleanup work and <laughs> what does it have to be at 4 a.m well but see it isn't it's not at 4 ask one of my friends and they'll tell you it's it's not 4 a.m and yeah no I, I understand that's um unfortunate and i wouldn't be offended if uh if um rush back if you we're unable to uh, toe the line for this. I'll try to be as interesting as I can. Maybe maybe the music will ramp up. It's a random music player, but maybe it'll be some hardcore like rave music or something. I'll crank it up and that'll keep you awake. But uh, yes, thank you for joining us, uh, Rush Back. Well, hello, just Nick D. And welcome, hello to you. And uh, hopefully you guys have some fun tonight. I'm looking at some of the stuff I'm gonna be doing. And babespiration. <laughs> nice. Uh, so yeah, so what I've got on the screen is basically just a little, that's the equivalent of like a GIF, um, where I just did something real quick with these two characters uh, in Toon Boom to make them look like they're dancing around a little. Uh, nothing too fancy. Um, if you've not joined me before, then uh, my name is Scott Claus, and I am somebody who loves animation. I've worked in 2D animation. I was doing 2D animation for a long time before I worked in the business. I worked at uh, Disney and DreamWorks, to name a few. Worked on a lot of their big 2D things, movies in the 90s, before moving into CG character animation and did a couple films for DreamWorks with them. They were just getting started and then moved into creature effects animation, doing monsters and, and cool creatures and things like that. Uh, and ending up with Life of Pi, um, which is the last, well, actually Percy Jackson and the Sea of Monsters was the last film I officially worked on, chronologically speaking, but uh, in terms of projects, notoriety, that sort of thing. Life of Pi is kind of what I'm known for, the, the tiger. Um, so I was a supervisor, one of the, uh, several supervisors on that film. And uh, so um, done all sorts of things with animation, done my own shorts, I've done, uh, I helped other people with shorts. Uh, I've always loved motion graphics and animation, and so I'm a big fan, and I love to talk about it, love to create it, love to work in the business. Right now, of course, I'm a, an instructor for CG Spectrum, and one of the th departments is the 2D animation uh, department, which I am the head of. And so uh, you can take our classes and learn 2D animation online uh, in the digital world as um, we like to call it. And we're expanding every day. We're looking into what well, we're not looking into. We're actually going to be expanding into 
uh, anime styles soon. Uh, we are just unrolling a, a, a program where you can do the kind of rigged 2D animation that you see in television shows where you're not actually drawing every single frame, but you're using an animation rig like you do in CG animation with Maya, uh, but it's a 2D character and then doing animation that way. Um, so that's just rolling out now. I believe they're taking signups for that even as we speak. If you're not sure if this is something that you're interested in doing entirely, or if you're not sure if you want to do something else, um, we also have other departments, other programs, and they even have uh, free stuff um, where you can sign up for a class and just get a sneak preview of it for a few weeks before committing to it. And so uh, if you like that sort of thing, you might want to check out cgspectrum.com. You might want to check out some of the other streams that are available where they talk about all sorts of cool things like Unreal Engine and ZBrush and uh, FX. Those are always really popular. Uh, but tonight, the topic is mostly 2D. I'm happy to talk about anything, but that's kind of the focus of the day. And that's what I'll be working on in just a minute. Uh, but that's uh, the... the topic of the day is 2D animation, how you do it, what you do with it, and people who love it, what you like. But uh, anyway, um, I'm always happy to answer questions of any kind. I'm happy to talk about anything you'd like me to discuss. Uh, talking about how you get into the business is really popular. Um, what do I do for my portfolio is real popular. I've talked about a lot of these things in the past, um, but I'm always happy to talk about them again. Things are changing all the time. Uh, new developments are happening every day. Uh, and so um, I like to keep updated on that. If you know stuff and you want to chat about things, um, please feel free to use the chat <coughs> section of wherever you're watching this from uh, to converse with me. I'll try to answer questions as quickly as I get them. Uh, you can also talk to other people who are hanging out. It's a great way to network, by the way. We've actually had some people introduce themselves here, and I don't know where it goes from there, but um, certainly the people have opportunities that they've heard of or different things that they've got uh, experience with. The only thing I ask is that you keep it clean and uh, because if you don't then you'll get booted off. We have somebody who's kind of keeps tabs on things and they'll uh, if not immediately then they'll eventually boot you off and you'll never be able to come back. So just keep uh, keep that in the back of your mind. Mind your P's and Q's as we say and um, yeah, and keep it friendly, but uh, have fun. And hopefully you guys have fun as we go through some of this stuff. And, uh, oh, well, hello, Harry. <laughs> Harry. I don't know if it's Harrison or Harry, but uh, you, know, you can tell me later. Uh, but anyway, welcome and uh, glad to see you. And hope it's not too early or too late for you here. Um, and 2D animation work for me, too lazy for it, but very interested. Well, Rushback, I mean, maybe that's a way to... Uh, avoid the laziness of it is if you work with rigs, 2D animation rigs. So uh, you never know. I will be, I promise I will be rolling out some uh, rigged 2D animation work uh, eventually. We're still in the process of making sure that's all ramped up and, and cool uh, for you guys to look at. And I'm still playing with it myself. But uh, one of these days I'm going to do a demo. Um, maybe as soon as next week I'm going to demo our, our 2D animation rig that we use in the class and uh, show you how easy it is to actually play with and animate a rig and get some cool results um, when you don't have to draw every single frame. But I still love drawing every single frame, which is what I'm going to do today. So Rushback, you got a question. Creature effects, does that include grooming? It didn't for me. <laughs> Somebody did it, but I didn't do it. Um, by the time I got the character rigs, all I did was animate on the thing and did not uh, was not responsible. People always ask me, uh, oh, and I've, I've got stuff, but I don't think I can show it. It's copyrighted. But they'll always ask me, oh, did you do the fur on that monkey? I've shown it to my students in class. They're sick of seeing it. It's like, nope. Um, no, I didn't have anything to do with that. I didn't render it. I didn't do the effects work in it. Now, all I did was animate it. Now, all, I spent months and months animating one single scene of a monkey and golden compass that they used as a showcase piece. Uh, but uh, as far as anything outside of just the, the animation itself. I had nothing to do with it. And they had scores of people doing that, making chipmunks and tigers and monkeys look wet, for example, at Rhythm and Hughes uh, was another thing that, that they would do uh, in Creature Effects outside of my department. Hey, John Skull, nice to see you as always. Heard anime is coming to CG Spectrum. You heard right. 
So yes, um, anime is coming to CG Spectrum. When and how exactly it'll manifest, uh, I am not 100% sure um, yet. I mean, I know it's happening, I know who's doing it, and we are doing it as we speak. I'm guessing it's going to be available in January-ish. And uh, from what I understand, it's going to be very limited. So it's going to kind of be a first come, first serve situation. I will speak about it in this stream as soon as I absolutely know uh, when it's possible to sign up for that. And the person who's doing it is a really exciting artist who has been working in Tokyo for years now. And uh, it's going to share a lot of stuff with us. And we're hoping that we can get her to do one of these or something similar. Either I'll have her on as a guest or she'll you know, do her own uh, speaking engagement, um, like a lecture or something that you can get a hold of. Um, either we'll do it via Restream or we'll have her do that separately for students only. But one way or another, it's going to happen. And I will let you know as soon as I have that animation. Uh, I will let you know as soon as I have information about how to sign up for or where to find out more information. Uh, but yeah, that's that's all um, coming up, and we're very excited about it. And then again, we have just gotten um, certification for Toon Boom, so that that's going to be another thing that we have to offer. And then we're looking to partner up, um, hopefully, with some cool. Uh, places and, and you know our goal at CG Spectrum you know, in a perfect world is that we can make you ready to go out into the world and get a job that's you know there's no promises no guarantees nobody can promise that or guarantee that but that is kind of the foundation of CG Spectrum is what do you need to be able to get a job what is it that um, that we can offer you so that you become more valuable again it's always going to be up to you and I talk about this at length every time I get on here in these uh, streams is that it is at the end of the day there's nothing anyone can do for you um, as far as your talent goes or your interests go uh, and even just you know like your networking that's that's all stuff that you develop over time and you, you do it uh, you're uniquely to whoever you are uh, but there are a lot of things we can help you with and we can give you a leg up and give you some support and help to point you in the right direction so uh, you know that's definitely one of the philosophies of the school is trying to get you up and ready for, for jobs. So anyway, so that's all coming. Uh, stay tuned to this channel and I will keep you posted as I hear things. And obviously like Rushback, you're connected and you hear um, things too. And so it's awesome when you share stuff. You may hear stuff that I don't even know about. <laughs> so um, so it's, I, I, again, I appreciate it when you guys communicate via uh, the chat. All right, so I'm going to now switch over to my work window and kind of go into the world of my scene. Before we jump into the scene, I'm actually going to just show you some things as usual. Uh, first off, I want to tell you where I got the inspiration for what I'm going to, what I'm working on today. I'm a big fan of this artist from the 1950s iteration of Wally of, of Mad Magazine. His name was Wally Wood, Wallace Wood. I'm a huge fan of his style. His style influenced mine more than anything other than maybe the Disney style when I was a kid and Warner Brothers and Bugs Bunny and all that. And so here's a still of a scene he did um, in it from a comic, a very silly tongue in cheek parody comic strip uh, about vampires. And these two small characters who you thought were just the annoying little brothers of the very vivacious character down in the lower left -hand corner. Um, they're on the cemetery in England. Um, it turns out that they're actually vampire bat people and they go flying off. And that's kind of a surprise in this panel. You're like, oh, I didn't know that they were vampires. And I just love the one with the big googly eyes, um, the white eyes. I just, uh, Wally Wood drew that character a lot or it, versions of that. And I kind of tried to copy his style in the kind of cartoony aspect of it. So that was um, one of the inspirations. And uh, then another inspiration is I'm just constantly drawing these Halloween characters. So I just thought I'd push this, put this up there just to show you that whenever I was in meetings, uh, there were lots and lots of meetings when you're a supervisor in a, in a production um, in a studio working on a film. And while I was in CG, I rediscovered my love of drawing. When I was drawing, every day, all day for a living in 2D 
uh, at Disney and DreamWorks, I kind of stopped drawing for myself. I just, it was the busman's holiday, as he used to say. And so when I started in CG, there would be a lot of times rendering would take forever. And when I say rendering, I mean like shooting out a play blast would take forever. And while you're doing that, I would just sit and sketch and I would draw uh, Halloween themed stuff uh, around this time of year. So, um, so this animation I'm going to work on, it comes out of my style, which is basically, you can see the bat up in the upper left hand corner. And then obviously the witch, you can see the Wallywood, blah, 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 50s look that I'm always um, doing with my female characters. If you saw the witch that was dancing earlier when this uh, stream first started, you can see the influence, um, not only of Wallywood, but uh, how it ended up into my own personal animation. So I just point this out by way of saying, you know, I was always, I'm still always drawing kind of Halloween themed stuff. I think it's just weird and creepy and cool and, and very creative and interesting. And so that bat in the upper left hand corner represents kind of the style I was going for today. And then obviously, um, this is a completed scene from a Flash thing. I don't know if anybody remembers Flash, but before uh, I got into Toon Boom, I would do Flash cartoons, which are very limited and uh, making use of limited animation styles. And that's more towards the rig animation style that I will be talking about in a future stream. Uh, but um, but this is, I just put this up here to say, well, that's probably what the look will be when I'm done with the scene I'm working on for today. It'll look something like this, assuming I ever finish it. Now, um, it's uh, increasingly difficult for me to finish things as uh, we get more and more wonderful students uh, for CG Spectrum as well as other commitments I have. And so uh, I haven't finished a lot of stuff. I've finished one thing um, during the stream time and, and showed it off and I got a lot of fun feedback. Um, but I'm so I'm looking to do something a little shorter today and just knock it out and see if uh, see how far I can get with it. But you see the little green faced creature on the far right of the, the screen next to the tree. So this is something like that. This is kind of little batty character. Uh, that was the goal that uh, I was going for. Well, Vampirina, aka Charlotte, yeah, I thought you, you and I have talked about this. I thought you would appreciate that. So thanks. I appreciate the, uh, the show of support for my character style. And then last but not least, here is um, a lineup of, uh, well, there's the dancing witch and then the pumpkin. I had initially hoped that I would have all those characters dancing for a little video that I made. Um, it's, it's on YouTube. You can see it. It's not that big of a deal. Um, it's basically what you saw at the beginning of the class, which is Jack and the witch are dancing and then the others are just sitting there. And then Jack is done by a um, rigged style. So he's just kind of got rubber legs. He's not really animated. But the witch was drawn frame by frame. Uh, hand drawn and uh, in between and done the old fashioned traditional way. Um, so one of these days, maybe I'll get uh, the whole thing going. I wanted to have them all dance like they're all booging, but it's just as you guys know, or my students like Harry and again, I hope I'm calling you Harry, this is okay. Um, but, uh, and, and even Charlotte, you know, you guys know this stuff takes a really long time. And so uh, a lot of, things in progress, not necessarily um, going to be able to finish them anytime soon, but we'll see. And so I think that's everything that I had as far as pre-production stuff. I'll just, oh, oh yeah, one more thing I wanted to mention, just because I know that there are anime fans on, out there. I bet you haven't heard of this one. This one is called uh, Jack and the Witch. And so when I was a little kid, and when I'm talking little kid, I'm talking like around the time movies were invented. Uh, that's how old I am. But no, it was actually um, more like the early 70s. They used to play this wacky cartoon on TV. It was a film from the 60s, late 60s, but an anime film from Toho Studios. And it was, uh, they would show it around Halloween time when I was a little kid. So circa 1972 and 73, I'm guessing. And uh, it, they showed it and then they disappeared. And it, I never saw it again. And for years, I mean years, that's how obsessive I am. I was looking for this cartoon and, and just trying to figure out, you know, did I dream it? Did it really exist? It's a really, really dark cartoon. It's a really dark anime. 
it's ostensibly it's for, for kids, but there's some nasty stuff in it. Well, I mean, nasty, but I don't mean like violent or anything. It gets a little violent, but no blood and guts or swearing. But it's just these cute cartoon kids go off on a little journey and then they find themselves in this wicked castle and the little cute little mouse character gets turned into a harpy, but it's actually a demon if you watch the original version with the Japanese soundtrack. Um, and, you know, they're being turned into demons and the, the implications that go with that. But they clean it up for American audiences and made it a harpy. And so uh, the, the movie is called Jack and the Witch. Um, I'm just going to pull it up show everybody so excuse my clacking uh, while I type this and pull it up uh, Jack and the witch from Toho and uh, I watched it on Amazon Prime now the only way to see it on Amazon Prime is to see it with uh, a lot of cropping so they crop the images it's a 235 CinemaScope film um, so it's cropped and then it's dubbed into English, and then it's not a particularly good print of the film. And so uh, do with it what you will. I'm not recommending the film necessarily. I'm just bringing it up by, by way of saying, uh, at a very early age, I was uh, I encountered this incredibly wacky film with a lot of dark imagery in it and a lot of really interesting character designs and anime way before I knew what anime was. I, mean, I was, I don't know, just very young I'll say very very young in 1972 or whenever this played on TV and they would play it every year but so I, I saw it at least twice but it just was just seared into my brain some of these images of the girl who you can't see this but if you look it up yourself she's got fangs I mean she's like a vampire girl and she's a harpy which means she's basically possessed by demons and you can see that everything turns out nicely in the end uh, here in this image uh, at the end but anyway so if you have any interest in this at all uh, you know feel free to check it out I think you can get it on Amazon Prime but that's the only way to get it and uh, like I said the print's not good and it's the images should be as wide as they are in this picture and they're, they're not it's it's cropped for uh, old televisions but it's it's pretty berserk and um, I don't know it's possibly one of those films that's better if you're a little bit should we say altered in order to to enjoy it fully whatever that means to you but uh but i love it i think it's it's just a real one of a kind it was followed up by jack and the beanstalk another crazy film that toho did um that uh, had a lot of the same vocal cast when they did the american version and i think it's a little bit easier to find that's this and that was another big influence on me as far as uh, the anime thing goes uh, it's just real spooky and really wacky, but it's a little more mainstream. It's not quite as over the top as Jack and the Witch was. Um, so that's Jack and the Beanstalk from, I think, 1975 or something. And so anyway, so really that's a long way around just to tell you that those were some of the influences that I uh, had and why I'm going to be drawing a bat for the <laughs> remainder of the day was these little characters and then the characters that I showed you earlier um, that are in my style based on those and based on Wally Wood and uh, just my style in general. So I'm going to go ahead and pull open the Harmony scene and uh, start getting to it. I'll show you what I got. I've got a question here. So rush back. How is this 2D animation industry looking with all the CGI overtaking it? Well, CGI already overtook it. This is a real important scene. What I'm going to do, or it's a very important question. What I'm doing is, uh, or what I'm going to do is show you this, what I've got in progress, and just let that run so you have something to look at while I'm uh, yammering away. So this is my scene in progress. Very rough, just very, very rough uh, first pass. I wanted to share something like that's just at the beginning stages because often I just show stuff that's in, uh, on its way to being finished or well on its way in progress um, and never really talk about the beginning stages of a scene and, and how to set stuff up and and things you encounter along the way. So anyway, so that you can just watch that um, while I mention that, that how is the 2D animation industry looking with all the CGI overtaking it? So the first answer to that is the CGI already overtook it. It already happened. It, it, it was finished as of, I think, eh, 2002. You can check me on that one. But the last person standing that I remember was Sinbad. We were the last production in town anyway that was doing 2D animation. 
Disney had already basically shut their doors to 2D with uh, Home on the Range, which I believe already had come out by the time uh, Sinbad came out. And so that finished it. You know, Disney, they sold off their desks. They said, we're done. We're not doing this anymore. And, um, and that was it. It's, you know, they just said, we're not interested in doing 2D. We believe that CG is more subtle. It's making more money, obviously. And it's hard to argue because CG animation has been going ever since then. That was 2002-ish. And here we are in 2020. And CG animated films are still making lots of cash and, and going on and on and on. It's hard to argue with people who are saying that CG animation is the way to go and 2D is not. Um, there are reasons for that. It's 2D is really time intensive. It's cost intensive. It requires a huge commitment on the part of the people who produce these films to complete them and uh, see that they're done in a way that is, uh, you know, uh, correct for, for the medium. And then what happens is they release a film and people kind of go, oh, that was all right. Well, I didn't really like it. I heard lots of people saying that about uh, Klaus when Klaus came out last year. People went, well, and I've may have been one of them, I apologize, but you know, people who are going, well, you know, it's all right. I wasn't, I wasn't overwhelmed by it, but boy, it sure looked beautiful. It was sure interesting. Um, and so, you know, is that going to inspire them to make more of these expensive and time consuming films? Not necessarily, but guess what? 2D never went away. 2D has always been around. It's um, ever since it was invented and the focus has been on television and uh, preparing things for uh, streaming services like Netflix. And as far as that goes, it's been tremendously successful. Um, nothing is overtaking it. It's still easier and cheaper to do 2D animated product um, for series than it is for um, CG, for them to do CG animation. And then you've got uh, places like Tokyo Studios Anime where they're still doing it analog style. They've never gone anywhere. They're still determined to keep doing it the way they've always done it so if anything lately with the uptick in the need for content on streaming services platforms like netflix you're seeing them wanting more content and asking hey does anybody know how to do this stuff we want to uh, have people are interested in it they want to see it so who's making it and um, we'll buy your stuff if you've got it so it's actually kind of a wonderful time to get into the business and um, there's becoming more and more of a business. I happen to know that uh, an animator I'm the, the acquainted with, or the friends with, um, Ken Duncan has just partnered with a studio called Nelvana, who made a bunch of stuff in the 70s, um, peaking with a film called Rock and Roll that a lot of people know and are familiar with. And a lot of people aren't, but uh, people from my generation, you say rock and roll, they know exactly what we're talking about. And uh, so he just partnered up with them. It's just a dream come true. I mean, it's the Duncan studio has been just chomping at the bit all these years to do uh, the kinds of films that they um, are good at doing, which is 2D animation and interesting films. And so Duncan did uh, Mary Poppins Returns. Mary Poppins Returns uh, last year, the sequel to Mary Poppins and worked you know, for hire. But what they have been longing to do is the kinds of things that uh, like Nelvana was doing, which is a little more interesting. I don't want to say more interesting, but a little less commercial mainstream, a little more gritty. And and, and I think it's just uh, going to take off like a shot. And I believe their first film is going to be uh, Mr. Duncan's um, project that he's been nurturing for years. And so somebody's going to have to help them make that. People will be able, need to know how to do 2D animation or to work on films like this. So between Netflix ramping up and uh, Duncan and Nelvana ramping up and other studios are getting interested again, and then studios like Goblins and uh, the Tokyo Animation Studios, they never went away. And so, and then I, I assume uh, that uh, Sergio is uh, doing another film after Klaus, um, but being rather quiet about it. But if somebody knows what it is, just uh, feel free to chime in. But between all that, I mean, just having those alone means there's more animation production going on, like the real stuff, not just um, um, weekly shows that they send a lot of it out overseas. Um, there's more going on now than in, in dozens of years, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, wouldn't it be great to be somebody who knew how to do this stuff just in time to get work on a show like that and uh, have that one of those experiences. So 
Yes, yeah, so that's my long-winded answer to rush back about how the animation industry is looking with CG <laughs> overtaking it. It's actually um, it has the potential anyway to go the reverse direction now, all of a sudden. So we'll see how that goes. But one of the things that I always say in my classes is um, to love what you do and do what you love. And uh, people who really love animation, they have been doing it all along. Ken Duggan never stopped. I mean, he's just, like I said, just been waiting for the opportunity. He got it with Mary Poppins Returns last year. And now at last, he looks like he's going to get to make one of his films with the, he's Canadian by origin and Nelvana's Canadian. It's just a dream come true. I couldn't be happy for him. And I hope to hear wonderful things coming up as a result of that. So, oh, good. Well, I'm glad you appreciate the answer. Yes. Um, as you can see, like I said, I'm passionate about this stuff and I, and I love to share things, especially when it's good news. Um, so feel free, like I said, to ask me at any time uh, what's uh, about things that you're interested in. And I will try to either answer or point you in the right direction. But uh, so doing hand-drawn animation, it's easy for you, classic AM87. Well, great. I'm glad to hear it. So um, I hope that you're out there and you're sharing your work and able to um, make use of it if that's something you're interested in. Uh, there are people out there who might be interested in hearing about that. So I'm going to now turn off the background and work a little more cleanly here. And I'm going to add a color card to this so that uh, when I'm working on the rough layer, it's a little more explicit. You will see that my work is very, very rough at this stage. So I'm just dealing with um, circles and just broad shapes. I've kind of tied down the last drawing so you get a little bit of an idea what the thing will look like, but I really haven't decided. The terrible form. Don't do what I'm doing. Don't uh, do do what I say and not what I do, um, which is you want to do a model sheet of your character and turn it around and look at it from all angles and make sure you uh, understand this character explicitly. I didn't do that because I've drawn this character many times and I say that as an excuse, but it isn't an excuse. You should do it um, you should have a, a really nice model sheet. What's going to happen when I go in and decide, well, how big should I make the ears um, and keep them consistent? How can I make sure and keep um, little things like the wings? I've decided maybe he's going to have these little hooky bits on the end of his, you know, the thumbs basically for a, a creature that has wings. Those would be his thumbs and then the rest would be his fingers. So, you know, how am I going to work all that out when I do want to clean up for him? What I'm going to do is I'm going to do a, a a cleaner pass as I go. Um, so uh, I am totally cheating on this one. Don't do that. Uh, work out your character in advance. It's a really good idea. But again, I've drawn this character a million times, so I already knew how it was set up. So the next thing I did was I went through and I did the keys. Um, uh, I started out, I'm not going to show you that pass because there's no point. Uh, I don't think there is, but I, I started out just using circles and just working out the timing of this. And so I um, created keys. Um, whoop, don't do that. Uh, so I'm going to just show you what the keys look like and how, where I started from. So here's just the key pass. So I started obviously with frame one, and then I, I did one where he was on the ground splatted, and then I did uh, an in between between those. So up, splat, and then an in between between those two that shows that he's turning and then he's going to splat. And then I, I really exaggerated him, so he's down on the ground. Um, when, uh, uh, here we go. I haven't had a chance to use this yet. Hold on just one second here. Hold on just a sec, guys. I just want to maybe just double check something. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Blah, 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 blah. Sorry, just a little technical glitch here. Just make sure. I'll set up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so just uh, bear with me for one second here. See if I can fix that up. They never actually taught me how to do it, so I'm just winging it. But oh well, then we get taken care of later. Anyway. Um, uh, 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 yeah, it's funny because I can see a whole bunch of uh, 
uh, swear words that have been banned. So, whoops. <laughs> so, anyway. Um, all right, so let's get back to the bats and uh, wanted to um, continue on showing you what I was doing with the, uh, the keys here. So here's one I'll pull out and show you this one a little bit better. So the next one I wanted to have the, the thing up in the air. Um, so it bounced from the ground up into the air and then popped over into its landing pose. So again, exaggerating that a lot more heavily. And then, um, cool, yeah, it's not showing up. <laughs> Thanks, Rushback. Yeah, it isn't showing up. That's the uh, the trick to this one. <laughs> it's like, mm, how do I reach out? Because um, either they came and went really quickly or they've hidden themselves another way. <laughs> So, yeah, oh, okay, I think I may have, no, no, they're hiding. So, we, yeah, thanks, thanks for the, uh, thanks for the suggestions, rush back. All right, so um, to keep moving along. So then I go over to the part where the little bat is actually gonna kind of raise its wings. So I wanted to put some anticipation, but not have it all going at the same time. So there's anticipation on two levels. One is the body and then the head, and then the wings are kind of following along with the body. So they kind of go up and back and then down. So I'll go through that a little more slowly. And this part's really sloppy because I just, um, um, yeah, they're not showing up. That's the problem. <laughs> they're not showing up in the actual chats themselves. So, wee. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> clever, clever, clever. Yep. So uh anyway. Yep. Uh so um speaking of uh of anticipation, this is um showing you how that the character goes down and then it comes up, and that I had the wings on a separate timing so that you could actually see you know the head comes up and the, the body comes up at different times and the wings come up at another time and then the wings actually were, were supposed to kind of come up into this flare so there's the anticipation for the wings going up into a flare and then back down again into this final pose now i'll probably end up fixing that a little uh, but the anticipation basically works where you're uh, anticipating something and then go up overshooting a little bit and then kind of lock back down into a, a final pose. So I'm still kind of working out the, the kinks of that, which is again, I wanted to make this nice and rough so you guys can see me working on stuff as we go and not have it all worked out. Um, so we can see my humble beginnings on a scene just like this. And then obviously I was doing this with the uh, background on so I could see where the ground plane on. But if you don't do that, sometimes it's helpful to just do another layer and uh, draw a line on that layer and just identify where your, where your ground plane is so that whenever you um, have your character supposed to be on the ground and they know you know where you're supposed to have it land. But again, I did that on another layer, did it before. Uh, so basically it's like that. Uh, but I think it's probably easier to show what's going on in my scene if you uh, don't see the background. If you have a color card, that white background. So now you can see a little more clearly and you can see how I integrated the keys. Um, again, really rough. I'm gonna try cleaning those up a little bit while we're here today. Um, but you can see already, hopefully, um, you can see the story of the scene just based on just these simple shapes that I've been roughing out. You know, obviously I did the head, I did the body, did the legs, kind of thought about the wings a little bit, and then even put the ears in as a, as, you know, just as sort of, well, what direction will the head go and you know how big are the how much of the ears going to flop around just as i'm getting my ideas down as quickly as i possibly could um, making some of those determinations already now there are some people who are master animators and would have drawn this character 5000 times uh, and uh, you know would have drawn maybe a little more cleanly than this but i always urge my students to draw as rough as you possibly can and just get your ideas down as quickly as you can and just think in terms of the 
the, the rough shapes of it, the, the circles and the smears and things that, that represent the action and not get hung up on the details. Because if you do, it's gonna take a lot longer for you to get your ideas down. And this, I just wanted to get the idea down and see if it was gonna work. Um, and so uh, then I went in and I started filling in the in-between. So I'll just kind of click through those um, while I'm talking. Uh, so from start to finish of a simple character animation, how much time would you invest in it? Well, the uh, investment is dependent on how good you want it to look and, you know, and how complex your scene is. And so one of the things I do in the classes is I urge my students to think of really simple character designs because you're going to have to draw this over and over and over. In, the, in a perfect world, you would end up with an assistant of some kind who could help you on your journey and get you to, um, you have to focus solely on rough animation and then you'd have a cleanup department to do the nice cleanup lines and, uh, um, and maybe even somebody to do your rough in-betweens for you and help you tie stuff down. Uh, unfortunately, when you're doing your own work, you don't have that luxury unless you have maybe an understanding friend, loved one, or spouse. So it can really take a long time. I would guesstimate that you could spend at least an hour per drawing if you're including the rough and the cleanup version. Maybe more if you're including a really detailed character for cleanup. Um, so you're talking about one to two hours maybe you know, to clean up and paint a single character. Um, and that's assuming you follow it through all the way to the end. Uh, in my classes, I generally urge my students to just keep it at the rough tie down stage, which just means it's rough, but it's tied down even more so than this. In fact, maybe I'll, I'll do a rough tie down of this character um, and then work backwards from there so you see like, what I'm talking about when I say a tie down. Um, so yeah, so if it's you know two to three hours per drawing, um, and then in this, this is a scene that is going to require probably well, I'm going all the way at least till frame 45 with uh, original drawings and a lot of it's on ones. So somewhere in the neighborhood of 45 or less drawings, maybe 35 to 45 if I'm lucky. And so you know, do the math, 35. If it takes only an hour, if this is a really easy character and it's a single color with no shading or anything, um, then it's going to take me at least that long, you know, a week, a week's worth of work. Uh, and then if I put more detail into it, more character, more um, character details, more color separations and things, and then it's getting into the two hour mark, then we're looking at you know 60 to 80 hours of work. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not for the faint of heart when it comes to the amount of time and energy that you put into it to make it look really special. Now, if you wanted to do something just simple, which I urge beginners to do, then, you know, circle, sphere of some kind, and maybe you're using vector, uh, for those of you who are not sure what I'm talking about, but, you know, using an ellipse and then adding some detail to it. You know, if I wanted to make a character that was just something simple, simple like that, well, how long did it take me to do that? And then I could take the, the entire thing and I could actually move it around by just cutting and pasting it on separate frames and you'll get it to hop around in the scene or something. And then if I wanted to, I could also make it squash and stretch this way as a unit. And then how much time have I come up with? You know, that's not gonna take me very much time at all. But then you have to ask yourself, well, but what are you gonna have when you're done? And so um, to return to my original screen, you know, on the left, you have the Jack pumpkin head, which is a one single drawing for the pumpkin shell not moving, so it's not doing anything. It's not squashing or stretching. It's not morphing. There's no blinks, no nothing. And then the legs were a rig, so the legs are just kind of morphing, morphing. I mean, that's just basically what they're doing, uh, like rubber a band. By contrast, you have uh, the witch, and every single one of those was a single drawing. And the reason she goes forward and goes back is because I only wanted to do one set and then reverse them. And so she puts her foot out and then I just reverse it. She puts her foot back. And that's because I had no time um, in order to just do something like that, where she's got a shadow under her hat and she's got some interior line work. Just, I wanted to keep the face consistent, wanted to keep her legs um, you know, like a consistent volume and match, you know, the parts that are moving so that 
um, so it doesn't look copy and pasted, but so that it looks like she's rotating in space. That alone, just doing this, which, you know, probably took me a week just to make sure it was nice, or at least let's just say a day or so of time when I might have been um, doing something else. You know, I mean, I didn't do it for work. I did it for fun. I just knocked these out just for the fun of it. And so it was on my own time when I had spare time um, and... Uh, you know, and it took a long time. So I'm like, well, I know I can't do a full piece of animation with these characters, but I wanted to crank something out real fast and fun. That's what you get. There you go. That's what I could do with a limited amount of hours. Um, other things I've done in this class, uh, sorry, in this uh, stream, uh, if you've seen them before, I'll show them again in the future. Um, but the little hero that jumps up and fights uh, with this rubbery looking monster. And then I've got a wizard that I did last couple weeks. And then uh, um, I've got a thing I did from uh, Dragon Slayer with Dirk the Daring where he's running around with a sword and it's real rough. And, and so each one of those, you know, it takes, they take a long time. They, they take a really long time. And that's why you haven't seen them finished yet is because the cleanup process may be the longest part of all. So uh, I'm kind of focusing more on the rough animation these days uh, because I think, again, rather than me just sitting there and drawing endlessly, although you know, some people enjoy that, and, and I'm certainly going to do it again, um, but uh, I can also do some of the rougher stuff and explain uh, what I'm doing as I go. Uh, so I'll just keep bringing these two back, um, Jack, and, and maybe somebody has a name for the witch, keep it clean. <laughs> uh, maybe somebody has an idea of what we could name the witch to and uh, dub that character with something other than the Dancing Witch. Um, but anyway, so that's that's what you get if you do limited styles sometimes. And uh, so if you really want it to look sweet, then you have to put in the hours and really uh, you know, dress it up and, and give it a lot of drawings, a lot of in-betweens. And that is, sorry, sorry for that. Um, and that is how you uh, end up with something that looks really nice. Now, do you have to have something that looks that nice for a perspective job? Not necessarily. Most of the animators I know who are worth their salt can look at a rough piece of animation and tell if you have what it takes to, to do the to job. And that they also understand that cleanup takes forever. And in fact, a lot of animators I know, um, they would rather see you spend more time on the animation and less time on the cleanup because cleanup can be sort of stifling. It can take your beautiful rough animation and turn it into something that's now a little bit too tight, a little too clean, and doesn't show the kind of loose drawing style that a lot of uh, animation uses. So uh, something to think about. It's just something to think about when you're putting a reel together or trying to showcase your work. Is it important that I have lots of special effects and gloss and, and glitz and everything's all painted up and nice and beautiful backgrounds? Uh, or is it important that I show that I can really animate and that I understand squash and stretch and timing and the 12 principles? And so you kind of have to define that for yourself. Let's take a class with me or one of our other mentors and make those determinations about um, you know, what would be the best showcase of your work uh, for a prospective employer if that's what you want to do. Now, if you want to make your own short film, that's a whole other story. Then uh, you, you just have to decide your style and stick with it and, um, and go from there. So, uh, you know, those are just things that you have to keep in mind as you go. Uh, so, <laughs> so Charlotte it reminds you of which version of Ginger from Gilligan's Island? You read my mind. Wow, that's total simpatico. That is exactly what I was thinking when I made that with, uh, um, uh, with the, the, wait, let's show it again. So. Yes, that, I was thinking of Ginger. There's this whole scene, and I'm really dating myself here, but there's a scene, if you're a real Gilligan's Island geek, where the, the women of um, Gilligan's Island get together and form their own singing group, and they do better than the guys do. Uh, they call themselves the Honeybees, and they do uh, this very 60s song, and I was just entranced with it as a kid in the 70s. And that's kind of what this is. It's kind of Ginger dancing to the, that's what my inspiration and the reference was. Um, I'm not doing their dance moves, but but that was kind of the idea of this. And well, also Anne Margaret from Flintstones. She appeared on the Flintstones as Anne Margrock. I don't expect anyone to know who that is at this point, but um, and she does a little shuffle thing with her feet. That's where I got it from. So Bradley Bradle says Serafina. Oh, that's excellent. That's a great name. I, I really like that. Thank you. I mean, we'll take a vote. You guys can tell me what you think, but I think that's a wonderful name. 
that's from something. Who's Serafina? That's from a show or a movie. Anyway, great name. How about the Wicked Witch of the West? Oh, yeah, that works. Uh, and um, yeah, so we got a couple votes for that so far. <laughs> yeah, so let me know if you guys think Serafina will stick. Uh, I think that's a beautiful name and it fits the character well. So nice. All right, so I'm just cleaning up this character a little bit and doing a little bit of a tie down. Not much. I'm still going to keep it really rough. Um, I actually like uh, the, the rough style. Um, and I, like I said, I always get kind of sad when you have to clean things up. And um, my sketches, I've, I've uh, printed several sketchbooks of my work. You can find it on Amazon.com. I don't know if I'm allowed to shell or pitch, um, but I do these things called anomalous. Um, so I have these sketchbooks that you can buy. Well, I'm going to just post it anyway. I don't think anybody cares. Uh, and um, what I did was I collected all my um, sketchbooks from all the years of taking notes uh, on productions and turned them into sketchbooks. Uh, you can do it too if you go on Kindle.com. No, uh, Kindle Publishing, Direct Publishing, it changed. Uh, you can go on there and you can um, make your own books and it doesn't cost you anything. I'm not shilling for Amazon by any means. I'm just saying it's you, it doesn't cost you to make a book. And uh, and then if you print them yourself, it costs you two bucks. But if you sell them, uh, you can buy them this way. Again, I'm not going to link to it because that's probably too much, but uh, but I'll certainly put it out here and you can look for it if you want. If you're interested in um, looking at my sketchbooks, I've got four of them, and they're just full of my sketches. And they're, it's a great resource to draw upon if you did these yourself. Um, you can collect your own work and put them into books and then give them away as gifts to friends, or you can look at them and refer to them. Um, if you ever need, like, oh, I remember I was going to do a, a duck. And, well, do I have any ducks? You know, I can just grab ducks you know, from my book. I've done lots of them. If you're really smart, you'll collate your books and put them into categories. And this is on topic because I always say you should uh, keep um, reference material. You should keep your stuff uh, collated into folders so that if you ever need a telephone pole or a, a grassy knoll or something, that you can go to a folder and look at, at that and put that in and, as a reference for your work. I learned that from watching the, uh, the documentary of R. Crumb, famous uh, underground artist from the 60s, and he did that. And he had just stacks and stacks of boxes. And that's why his stuff looks so good, is he used real life reference and he didn't just make stuff up. Well, most of my stuff is made up on the spot um, while I was sketching. But uh, um, but anyway, uh, that's um, one of the things that you can use as your own resource is uh, checking in and using um, stuff like that uh, that you've created yourself as, as your own ref reference materials. And so um, just a little, little pitch for my stuff, but, but it's mostly it's a pitch for you if you're interested in doing that for yourself. Um, it just it doesn't cost you anything to, to get a book made. Um, it costs if you sell it, you have to charge they have to charge a certain price. Um, but uh, for your own purposes, you can get your own book for a couple bucks. Um, the price that was showing on the screen, that's not your personal price. It's what they sell them to make money off of them. And they take a cut and you get the rest. And again, I'm not associated with them at all, and I don't, I'm not endorsing them or recommending them other than it's just something cool that I found, and I've been using it for years. And uh, you can check my stuff out that way if you want, my, my drawings. All right, got some question. Do I use 3D animation as a reference? Sometimes. I absolutely use 3D animation as a reference sometimes. Um, uh, the, the best thing to do is use the real world, but since I'm a CG animator in the first place, and I'm very comfortable doing CG animation as well as 2D, um, I like to try my ideas out first in the CG environment and then uh, plop them out in the 2D environment. And the difference is when I put them into 2D, then I actually uh, add a lot more squash and stretch and a lot more of the 2D principles. But at least it gives me a starting point to work out timing. And so... Uh, yeah, so I, I urge people who have a knack for CG animation, some of my students uh, are like that, I urge them to consider, you know, just blocking out some polygon shapes and using that as your starting point for, uh, for a scene. 
it can be really helpful and it's not hurting anything. The important thing is just to remember that that's just, it's like motion capture. It's just your starting point. You don't want that to, you don't want to lean on it too heavily because your work will look really different. It'll look like motion capture and you want it to look loose and free and floppy. That's the fun of 2D animation. Um, unless, you know, unless you're going for something a little more silted, that's a little more of an anime style that's more realistic or uh, more uh, stylized in general, well then, yeah, sure, go ahead and, and make it a little more stilted that way. But for, uh, for my purposes, I just use it to block things out and I don't tend to uh, keep it once once I've gotten the timing of it set up, then I'm then I'm done with it and on to the next thing, which is what I, what you see here. Um, so this I've already refed this out uh, in another form and used another reference uh, for it. And I've also done this before. This particular bit of business, I'm doing this again for practice. Uh, so um, the the little flip here. So I, I technically I suppose I kind of cheated a little because I've already done it um, in the past. But when I'm doing Twitch streams, it's not a good time for me to be coming up with stuff on the spot. I always tell people you really need to get into your zone when you're doing this stuff. And that's one of the joys of animation is um, for people who are a little more, um, they like to work solo, a little more introverted. Uh, it's great. It's perfect. I mean, I was, I'm a very introverted person, even though I, um, I always tell people I got rid of my shyness by working as a jungle cruise operator at Disneyland a couple summers in college. Um, but I still consider myself someone who really likes quiet and needs to recharge his batteries by just drawing and working and listening to stuff and not talking and not thinking. And that's how I get myself back when I'm kind of lost. And uh, so it's a great job for some people who are like that, who, who like that sort of thing. Um, what's odd is that you can also lose yourself uh, when you're animating on the job and then where do you go to recharge your batteries well then i would do music so i stopped drawing when i was doing 2d for a living and i would then uh, work on my musical projects uh, to kind of come down and get myself back when i get too lost in my in my career stuff so anyway that's how it's gonna look kind of um all right so uh, Drawn School, you're watching Orphan. Is that the one where I don't want to spoil it? But is that the one where you you kind of find out she may not be who she thought you thought she was at the end of the movie? That was really really effective ending. I think that's that was a really fascinating movie. They they were pushing it all over town before it came out, and yet it was still kind of just a B movie. Um, and so I didn't see it at the time, but when I did see it, I was pretty impressed at the actress who played the lead character. If that's the one I'm thinking of. Um, so Bradley Bradle says, how do you feel about tracing for animation such as recording the base moves of a scene with a camera, then drawing the base poses on the computer? Um, I think, so this, for Bradley Bradle's your question, I think that you're talking about um, the wave of the future or the wave of the present even, um, that uh, we now live in a world where hybridization is a thing. It just is. And you can hide from it. You can run and hide from it where you can embrace it. And by embracing it, what you're doing is you're saying, all right, this technology is a tool. What can I do with it? How can I enhance my work and uh, do better work with the aid of tools? I always talk about when um, CG, and I'm oh, sorry, when uh, we were animating 2D traditionally, uh, but we were still uh, kind of in the same old mode um, of scanning drawings into the, well, first we use Xerox drawings and then painted them in ink and paint, and then we'd scan them and then do the ink and paint digitally. And uh, there was a lot of outcry about, well, you're taking away people's livelihood. They ink and paint for a living. It takes a lot of people to paint the cells and it's beautiful. And you know, look at an old school film like Sound, um, Sleeping Beauty or something. And these gorgeous hand painted films, well, then you look at Lion King or Rescuers Down Under, the first two that were done uh, with digital ink and paint, and you realize um, there's no way they could have done that by hand, you know, hand painting every single cell. And the tool existed, it worked, it looked beautiful, so why wouldn't you do it that way? And um, I don't know prohibitively, I don't know how much it cost, um, but I'm guessing that in the long run, it was less people hours, which is sad, 
um, more computing hours, which is a variable expense depending on how you look at it. And um, you know, but but the results were it, it, it took over everything, and there was no more um, hand painting of cells, at least not in this country. And and that's just the way it went. It was, so are you going to stop progress? So that's the same thing with um, you know the new waves of two D animation that are happening. Is it's an opportunity for a hybridization. Everybody wins. People who prefer the technology of CG work. I get to work with that aspect of this animation and then people who are more about drawing um, get to do that and then people like myself who love everything um, you know are more busy than they know what to do with and so uh, there's room for everybody at the table currently there was a time when it was like we're either going to do 2d we're going to do uh, cg but i feel like that time has passed and even while we had that going, there was never a time when artists weren't necessary. Just so everybody understands that whether you're working on a computer or whether you're working on paper, you still have to be an artist. The computer can't do stuff for you. And if it can do stuff for you, then um, it's going to look like a computer did it. So we've talked about that before with, uh, I think it was Blender. We were talking about, you know, do you use the models? Do you uh, use the animation presets that they give you? Well, if you do, the, everybody else is using them too. And so your stuff's going to look like everybody else's. Meanwhile, there are artists out there who are cranking out um, their original visions of things and just making this incredible artwork. Uh, you know, art station's a good place to go and look and see what other people are doing that still relies on the old masters for the inspiration, uh, painters. Renaissance painting, you know, all sorts of influences, but there, but that hasn't changed in, in hundreds of years. You still have to be a good artist to be able to survive and do good work, and so, um, so that's that doesn't seem to be going anywhere. There is yet to be a computer that comes up with the actual artwork, and when computers can do everything, as many of you have probably seen with CG animated films, um, where a lot of stuff was done by computer people reject it <laughs> and so that's why with the mo most recent trilogy of the star wars film suddenly you had people making practical effects uh, because people are like eh, it doesn't feel right it doesn't it, it isn't as satisfying as when you know that somebody was actually there on the set um, with doing something um, i always point out the difference between the original version of the exorcist speaking of horror and halloween films um, the original version of the 1973 Exorcist, or 72, whatever it was, and um, and the Redux that they did in, I think, 87 or, ni yeah, 97, 97, um, where they added all these digital effects to it because they could, and it was new, and everyone was excited about that. And so people had speculated for years, oh, um, there are demons in the mists and a couple scenes and or in the window or looking, and of course it was nothing like that at all, but... They went and added those things digitally in 97 because everybody was doing that then. Aren't we clever? And I don't know about anybody else, but when I saw it, I was I thought it was silly because it, and it wasn't scary because you knew how they did it. They added it digitally. We all knew. Even if you don't understand digital effects very much, people can look at it and go, oh, yeah, but it was probably CGI. It wasn't a trick of the light or my brain playing tricks on me or Satan stepping into a movie set and doing take after take as people thought with the original film in the 70s. I mean, they really did think that it was possessed by the devil on screen because nobody knew how it was done. Dick Smith was a genius uh, makeup person who came up with groundbreaking effects that are still used. Um, they still do bladder effects and things. And it's still alarming when you see it on screen and it's you know it's real done on the set because like how on, the, on earth did they do that? Um, so... The point of this long rant is that there's room for everybody at the table, um, but the artists are always going to be the most welcome ones because they're the innovators and designers and people who are coming up with new ideas every day on how to, um, you know, really basically reinvent theater, which is where all entertainment comes from, um, and uh, reinvent waking dreams, which is what movies and shows are, is people having a collective shared dream. And so as long as there's a need to, to have that, which seems like there is, 
and they're going to need people who know how to to keep it fresh. And right now, that's with a combination of digital art and analog art. So that's my final stance on the subject until somebody asks me again. <laughs> so, aha, uh -huh. hey JD, nice to see you again. It's that time, huh? I really enjoyed your um, your Halloween film countdown. That's really fun. I came to it late, but uh, I didn't see you were doing it until late, but I'm glad to see it. <clears throat> so, I can't remember, was the spider walk in the original theatrical cut? The spider walk of the exorcist was not in the original cut. It was shot, and it was part of the book, and they did it, but they didn't think it looked good, so they cut it out. And so, um, even when you see it in the film, you're, you're seeing in the redux, you're seeing the original enhanced slightly uh, for, um, for the... Um, the digital age, but uh, yeah, they didn't just they decided not to use it because it didn't work. And, and I believe I saw it. Well, I mean, I had seen it before the Redux came out. I'd seen stills of it. I don't remember how it's in a book or something. Um, and so uh, I, I believe they had the footage. It was available, but they didn't include it in the theater version, the one that, that played for years. I actually saw it. Um, I got to hang out with Linda Blair briefly, and uh, William Friedkin was there. This was 2013, and they showed the Redux. And I had never been a fan of it, and then I saw it in the theater, and I was like, oh, that's awesome. I'd never seen the film itself in a theater before, and the sound was the biggest deal. It was just like, wow, they really, really upped the bar for the sound in the Redux version. So for that alone, I kind of forgave it. Um, and then the other scenes I didn't think were too harmful they didn't affect it but the cg animation they added i thought was just ridiculous and, and unnecessary so again that's my opinion on the subject i'm always interested to hear other people's opinions uh on anything at any time as long as again as long as you're cool and not inflammatory in the things that you say i try very hard not to be even though i like to uh, share my strong opinions about some things um, that are not necessarily on topic with everything else I'm discussing. But yeah, right now what I'm doing is, is I'm just going through and I'm cleaning up my keys and adding a little more detail to them. And I'm going to play the keys together and just see if I've captured the essence of this move. And if I'm keeping things like the wings consistent, at least a little bit, just, I'm just adding a little more consistency um, so that I can go back and start tying stuff down and making choices about, um, you know, just some of the thicks and thins of the exaggeration. And like here, you know, I'm going to compare this one to the one where he's finished. It's like, obviously that one's not even close. So I'll probably um, copy and paste and uh, see if I can, um, what's the word? We'll just resource some of the stuff that I've already done with this rough version for this one where he's quite a bit different uh, earlier on in the scene. And then that way I can keep things a little more consistent overall. Um, I also, before I was, uh, before I came on live with this, I was doing some uh, resizing and retiming of things too. So um, some things have been shifted around in the interim yeah, I think, I think I'm just going to do a copy and paste job and keep his feet at least. And then, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Sometimes, uh, again, it's like trying to do this stuff on the fly while I'm on Twitch. I don't want to sit and work something out to that much detail. So, yeah, I'm just going to copy and paste his lower half and then see if I can steal any of the other parts. I'll just move that on over and... Bam. And that's one of the things I love about the digital world is we couldn't do this with uh, paper. We could Xerox things. Xerox was our best friend. In fact, I was good buddies with uh, the person who did the Xerox machine at my first studio. And uh, we all had a lot of laughs. And he would tell us what life is like when your sole job is running around and servicing Xerox machines. I wonder if he still works doing that. It's been several years, I'll say that much. Um, but with Toon Boom and with programs such as this, we don't need to do that anymore. And that's just wonderful. We can just instantly copy and paste something and see if it's working or see if we need to adjust stuff. 
and then move stuff around and copy and paste at will without ever having to uh, go to a copy machine and try to resize things by 87% or whatever. Anyway, and so JD, so you enjoyed the recut. In fact, didn't run it for you. Cool. You care for is the added scene at the end of the film between the detective and the priest. Well, this is going way off the subject, but um, you know me, JD, I can't help but talk about these things. Um, that was a, well, I'm sure you probably know all this stuff already, but um, anybody who's interested, it was a whole thing about how they should end the film. And uh, William Peter Blatty apparently really believed in everything in the movie, I mean, in the story, in the book that he read, wrote about exorcisms. He believed that they were real and that it was a thing. And uh, he was very spiritual, let's say. And he was kind of offended by the film because it was not that way it was a lot more of an emphasis on the dark side and it didn't really emphasize that good had won and uh you know freaking at least according to the talk he gave us when we saw the film um, he was like yeah i don't believe in any of this stuff it was just a movie and i wanted to make it as dynamic as i could and so i made it as powerful as i could and that was to end it in a very shocking way plus it was the post it was the vietnam era or slightly post vietnam in 73 so a couple more years but by 73 the vietnam war was was over for most fortunate people um, and by 75 it was over completely and exorcist came out i remember when it came out it was late um 73 so it was almost 74 so really the vietnam had ended vietnam had ended for most people it was just sweeping up which is bad enough but uh, yeah, I don't want to get into that too much, but um, but so it, but it was an era when people were used to seeing shocking, nihilistic things. Seventies films are uh, are very shocking and very nihilistic. They make um, torture porn films of the ninety of the two thousands two thousand four and thereabouts um, look almost quaint because the values of the films are so high, the production values. Um, whereas the grittiness of the 70s films, if you've seen any of them, it's something, it's really something else. And the moral compass of them is kind of dodgy for a lot of them. And they're just, just really gritty and raw. And that's because of the Vietnam influence, seeing Vietnam footage uh, in the families. I mean, we're watching that while they're eating, eating dinner every night and seeing you know, what's going on over, over there. And, and as well as things like Night of the Living Dead, which... I mean, it was kind of a product of the era and also shaped the era. And making things look like gritty newsreel footage makes them even more alarming. And now I know a lot of people who think that Night of the Living Dead is the most boring film ever made, um, but I still think it's very powerful. And I think uh, it's, it's uh, still it's a really good film even without all the nastiness that happens. So, uh, but but yeah, it's products of their era. And so, um, exorcists lines were forming around the block. As people were and people were being carted out of there, were well, not many, just a couple of people were made um, unhappy by it, made rather ill by it, apparently, and um, had to be helped out of the theater. And um, because it was just because I think it's just a really intense movie, or at least it was. Again, I know lots of people who think it's a boring film, but uh, I think it's a really well-made movie, and I loved seeing it on a big screen. And um, if I have a problem with the effects, I just thought that they looked dated even at the time. And I was just used to seeing it without them and being able to look at where she's floating up above the bed and going, wow, I, I still don't really know how they were able to. I've seen the behind the scenes footage to get her to be uh, on piano wire and lifted and uh, make it look flawless when you see it on a big screen. Um, or virtually flawless, flaws more flaws than most things that, that were comparable. I try to think, you know, like some of the films that were out at the time, and you think about the effects work that was happening in those films by comparison, and it's it's a pretty remarkable achievement. But but also just a really well made film that draws you in and uh, gets you involved very quickly, and then makes you wait and suffer the first time you see it until something happens. And you're just sitting there with your knees knocking the whole time because you just know it's coming. And then when it does, it just comes like a protracted scream. Um, so, yeah, I, again, I know people who were like, eh, that wasn't shocking at all. But it was at the time, trust me. Just the trailer itself shocked everybody. I'm just like, I don't want to know about this stuff. This is just too much. 
anyway. Never thought I'd be making breakfast at 5 a.m. Well, Rushbeck, I appreciate your uh, dedication and I appreciate your company. So um, hopefully we're keeping you company in the wee hours. And uh, feel free to um, chime in with any old thing that you're interested in and uh, personalize it a little bit. But uh, John Skull, Freddy vs. Jason was originally supposed to release in the year 1989. Was it? I didn't know that. That's interesting. And a lot of people hate that film. Um, I thought it was fun, but then I don't have anything invested in it. I just thought it was goofy and silly. I actually like my horror films to have a little bit of humor. Joe Dante always used to say that if you don't put humor into your horror films, the audience will find it. And certainly it's been in a horror film that's supposed to be serious and you find yourself laughing. And um, that's so a good uh, horror film director knows when to release the tension and uh, give you a laugh here and there. And so, um, uh, and so I, I actually kind of appreciated Freddy versus Jason. I thought it was silly. I didn't think it hurt anything. I know people who think it hurt the franchise or was not canon or something. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I'm just not that dedicated, I guess. Sorry. But I always like to tell everybody, and you guys have heard this already, but I got to watch Friday the 13th some few years ago um, with Adrian King um, sitting right next to me or a couple seats down, actually. And we'd all hung out before the movie. And, and I was a huge fan of Friday the 13th. It's one of my favorite movies. I can't really watch it now. Even that night, I watched it with Adrian King sitting there, Ms. King sitting next uh, to us. Um, I, I suddenly occurred to me, I'm like, wow, this whole film is just people like playing Monopoly and making coffee and wandering around in the dark. Nothing happens except for just a few short little moments. But the first time you see it, you don't know when it's going to, again, like Exorcist, you don't know when it's going to show its fangs. You're just, you're just terrified. You've heard it's a scary movie and you're expecting it to be scary. And then the ending delivers. It's real tense with all the chasing and all that. And, you know, when it's shocking, when it was shocking, it was very shocking. Again, the kind of Dick Smith latex makeup effects. Um, but to watch it after seeing it 550,000 times um, on a big screen uh, with Adrian King two doors down, it's, was, I almost fell asleep. I was like, wow, just nothing happens in this movie for a really long time. And then it all gets good. But um, yeah, it's just about a bunch of camp counselors setting up a camp and talking and hanging out. It's kind of funny. I never would have suspected that that film, which is so revolutionary, would turn out to be sort of almost almost relaxing, <laughs> except for a few specific moments. If you cut those out, it's, it's actually a little quiet little movie. So anyway. Um, so Charlotte, you love Night of the Living Dead. You sat at the Hollywood Fever for every second. So, okay, I'm not, I'm not squ skittish, I'm terribly skittish, and I'm not, you know, spiritual. I don't, I'm not afraid of any Thing. You know, I don't think people come back from the dead and I don't believe in ghosts or anything. But boy, I don't know if I could watch Night of the Living Dead at Hollywood Forever Cemetery. We watched Carrie and that was already in that film. No, it was The Shining. Not at the Hollywood Forever, but at another one. We watched The Shining and it was the people I was with. It was giving them them the willies. It just, it's just the atmosphere and just you're walking around in the dark. I mean, I guess Hollywood Forever would be more crowded than the one we went to at the out in the valley, but um, I don't know, just you're looking around at all these people and you're watching people on the screen turning into zombies and and it's a you know it's a dark movie. I, it still gets to me. So uh, I still find the my my Waterloo is the trowel. I just I, that'll never ever cease to not disturb me. Um, it's just so well done, so effective. And my mom walked in when I was watching it at 19, I think, and she was on TV and she just sat down with me and looked at me and she goes right right when the trial, trial scene happens right after the, the gore with the people eating um, the crispy crunchies the, the, um, when people get fried in, in the truck and she just looked at me and she goes do you watch movies like this all the time is this really what you've been feeding your head with i'm like no mom this is this is a special one this one's different i had not seen anything quite like that up to that point in 1985 or whenever i saw it and it, even by my standards, it was it was rather rough. And then I went to, on to see Day of the... Was it Dawn of the Dead? Dawn of the Dead with the shopping mall. And all bets were off after that. You know, the, up until then, the glorious film ever made. 
and one of the best horror films ever made still, I think. So, so for those of you who aren't into horror films, I apologize, but it is Halloween, right? So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk about your, your horror. That's a favorite subject of mine. JD uh, should have been much worse that they did a decent job. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, 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 it should have been worse, could have been worse. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it is what it is. That's the way I looked at it. It was never intended to be anything but, you know, battle. And, uh, and I always say, you know, what were you expecting? The, uh, the thing is a battle between two people who can't die. You know, who, I mean, Freddy's case not even necessarily exists in the first place, other than in your dreams. So, you know, what kind of a battle is that? It's, you know, that's for those of you who've taken my story class. I know, I think at least one person, maybe not, but um, that's something that we I talk about actually in the story classes. You got Freddy, you got Jason. Neither one of them die. What kind of a battle is it? And what kind of tension is there in your story when you know that neither one of them is when they're both immortal? So something to think about. Also, they have a orphan prequel in the works called Esther. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I'll check it out. I would be interested. Like I said, I liked Orphan. I thought it was a very well-made movie and an alarming ending that, that was uh, not unexpected. Well, actually, it's kind of expected, but um, very well handled. So, so, Charlotte, you wish you could watch it in the cemetery alone. I've got another one for you then. Have you seen... Um, uh, children shouldn't play with dead things. So I wonder if anybody's seen that. Just the poster for that alone uh, scared me to death when I was a kid. Is uh, um, uh, 1972, same year I saw that scary animated anime film. Uh, it's different. It's a very different take on Night of the Living Dead. Not everybody would probably get into the spirit of it. I think you would, Charlotte. Um, I'll just show you the poster and let that speak for itself. So here we go. Um, anyway, there's a character in that film um, who would love to share the cemetery with you and watch Night of the Living Dead. And uh, so Children Shouldn't Play with Dead Things is a um, different kind of zombie film way back from 1972. They gave it a PG. I don't know how. Uh, it's a pretty rough PG for but then the 70s. And it's got a real sardonic quality to it, very cynical. It's a bunch of actors and they talk and the lead guy is so obnoxious people some people just can't get over him at all some people get into the campiness of it so it's very campy very funny and then the zombies hit and it's night of living dead all over again and it's it's real rough and and really scary and fun but there's a character uh, charlotte that you would probably find interesting i should probably say this for a class but anyway we're on the topic of horror films and nobody can have seen that if you have seen it you're real hardcore hardcore uh, old school 70s this is way before um, even Texas Chainsaw 70s. This is 1972. They're all wearing stripy bell bottoms, which uh, is near and dear to my heart. I had a pair of those when I was a kid and wore them proudly. Uh, anyway, so back to uh, back to uh, animation. Um, Vampire, that's just a recipe for disaster. <laughs> yeah. And who would win? Freddy Krueger, Jason. Well, that was my point. Um, if you've seen the film, you'll you know who won, which is, I believe, it was a uh, an open-ended draw, and a lot of people had a problem with that ending. But honestly, what are you going to do? Same thing with Predator versus uh, was it Xenomorphs, Alien? You know, it's, if they both, if one of them dies, that's the end of the franchise. You can't, they can't ever die, right? So, you have to find a way to just keep it going. So it was kind of a given before the thing started. You kind of know what's going to happen and it isn't about that it's about the getting there and i thought that freddy versus jason had its tongue firmly planted in its cheek while also delivering some icky stuff what about that whole mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation thing now come on that was genuinely nasty i laughed um, i did not see that coming and, and of course it was gratuitous and it was you know just dumb but but at the same time it worked i mean that's what a horror film's for to have fun, have it be like a roller coaster ride. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I thought that was good, silly fun. Already made a movie about it. Go run it back. It's a rush back. Who would win? <laughs> I'm so sure. Drawn Skull asks, "Have I seen Sleepaway Camp?" Yeah, 
Yes. <laughs> yes, I've seen. Sorry, anybody who's seen it, hopefully you get that reference. Uh, yes, I've seen it. I have not seen any of the sequels. I heard that some of them are fun. Um, I don't. In fact, I think there was one where she came back uh, for the sequel. Um, the actress who was made famous in that role. For those of us who think it's a famous movie, um, I didn't see it until later, though. I mean, I saw all the splatter, uh, all the slasher films originally on cable when I was a kid um, in high school in the 80s. So I saw them at the time, the uh, Terror Train and all that stuff in the Freddy and Jason movies. Uh, but I did not see Sleepaway Camp until I was much older and I had kind of a renaissance. I had a online friend who was really into horror and got me back into it briefly and that sort of thing. And, and he told me about it and I don't know how I missed it, but boy, that one's different. That was definitely a horse of a different color and I really appreciated it for its odd qualities. And then the cinema snob does a really good take on it. If you know any reviewers, if you like YouTube uh, reviewers, the cinema snob, snob does a great um, take on that film that I thought was fun. So if you like that sort of thing, people doing commentary. Um, for me, it, it began with, the commentary began with Elvira. That was the first time I really uh, paid attention to people interrupting a film, horror films and rubbish films and making bad jokes, rubbish jokes about uh, the, the films themselves. And then obviously Mystery Science Theater, I was a big fan of that. And then they're still going, or they were going, uh, as Rift Tracks. So if you're interested in the Mystery Science Theater thing, if you like that, um, the guys still do it. Um, they just do it as a thing called Rift Tracks now. And uh, you can find a lot of them on Amazon Prime. I catch them every now and then. I just, I don't know, I think it's fun. And it looks like they're really good live too. I've seen a couple of their live ones. And uh, I mean, I've seen them on Amazon Prime, live versions of their Rift Tracks. And it looks like it's really fun. They did Birdemic, that's one of my favorites. And uh, The Incredibly Strange Creatures. Um, that one's another one. That's an old classic rotten film. Anyway, I'm getting way off topic here. All Elvira is free to stream on Tubi right now. Wee! Awesome. Well, that's great. Thanks for telling us about that. Um, yeah, I really love Elvira. I saw her live at Knott's and she was awesome. I met her in the 80s. I completely forgot about it that's what happens when you get old kids <laughs> she she's uh, one of my favorites and i completely spaced that i had actually met her and got to talk to her and i um, got my picture taken and not with her but at her stand at some event or other and uh so but uh, yeah, i saw her not she did a great show cut two or three years ago or maybe it was more than that i don't know four or five Whenever I went last to Not Scary Farm, she did a show and it was just excellent. Yeah, it wasn't too long ago, a couple years, three years. Uh, so I'm glad she's still around, still doing Halloween. She looks fantastic. And uh, she's free on Tubi. That's great. Thanks for tipping us off to that. Drawn Skull, we saw was Halloween. He changed the channel and stopped, and all you see is a guy in a white mask holding a telephone. <laughs> nice. Yeah, well, actually, you have sneak previews. I'm another big fan of another big fan of um, Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel when they had their sneak previews show, and they showed the entirety of the end of Halloween on their show, and uh, scared the daylights out of me. Um, but also gave away the entire ending of the movie, which is funny. I don't know how they justified doing that or getting away with it. But uh, by the time I actually saw the film, it was kind of redundant because I'd already seen it. The choicest bits. Um, on sneak preview, they, I mean the whole thing with the closet and then the final line. I'm not going to spoil it in case somebody out there hasn't seen it, but the whole thing with Donald Pleasance at the end, the boogeyman and stuff. They showed the whole thing, and uh, I was like, "Well, great! Now I won't sleep for a month, and uh, also don't really feel like I need to see the movie anymore." But uh, I, I love that film. I think it's, again, it's a beautifully made movie. It's just a really well-made film, uh, Halloween, and um, set the pace for a lot of films after. I, I'm sure you guys already know, but Friday the 13th was basically a, an attempt to cash in on Halloween. They didn't even have a title for it, if I remember correctly. And they were just, it just it's a slasher project. We're just going to do a, a slasher like in the mode of Halloween. 
And then Halloween, for those of you, again, I'm sure you, the hardcore fans already know this, but Halloween was actually kind of a ripoff of Black Christmas, which was, I don't know if they consider it the first slasher, the first official in the genre that's canon. Um, but that's a doozy of a movie. That's I saw that one later in life when I'd seen everything by the time I saw that. And I was still really blown away by it. I had no idea it was as good as it is. And that Margot Kidder just knocks it out of the park. She's just so fun as this kind of hateful, chain-smoking person. And Andrea Martin, who I got to meet later in life um, from and who was in SCTV, that she's in it. Wonderful. So yeah, Black Christmas. The original Black Christmas. I don't know anything about the new one. But uh, but um, the uh, the Black Christmas from the '70s is is great, and it influenced uh, the making of Halloween. And then Halloween kind of influenced Friday the Thirteenth, and then the billions of sequels. I actually meet people now and then who saw the sequels first and preferred them to the original movies. Now, my um, my old, <laughs> mature heart sort of balks at that and says, oh, could you not like the original best? But I get it. If you saw the, the uh, sequels first, those are the ones that, that mean something to you. And so uh, I went to a screening, that one with Adrian King, Friday the 13th, and it was one of the sequels. I don't even remember which one. At least four or five. It was not three. Um, we're still waiting to see that one on 3D officially. Um, but it was, um, I think it was like 1986, around about that era. And people were saying, yeah, that is my favorite one. That's the best one. And I'm just I'm sort of like, mm, okay. You know, it's it doesn't mean anything to me because I didn't see it when I was growing up. I didn't see it until I was much older. Um, but people were like, yeah, yeah, this is the best of them. I'm like, okay, yeah. Who am I to disagree? It's, it's, uh, I think it's something that you hand on, just like animation, you pass it along. Um, and new generations discover things like Rocky Horror and uh, for some reason, and it just keeps going. And then as long as people are interested, it'll just keep going. And it seems like people are. Halloween is what, 78? Black Christmas is, well, Halloween, that's probably the most famous one. In 1978, and it's still kicking. Rocky Horror is from 75, and it's still going. Frankenstein and Company are from the 30s, and that's a pretty long run. Um, although I don't know that people actually watch those films anymore. If you have tried to watch them, maybe you've noticed that they're 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 kind of they become increasingly difficult to watch each year as uh, time and tide you know, moves on. Um, I was never afraid of Frankenstein or Dracula, the Mummy. That one kind of got to me, but that one's a little bit later. I don't know. But uh, yeah, as long as people are interested in these things, um, they'll stick around, and new generations will discover them and make them famous. And that's kind of the same thing with uh, animation, which is if people want to see it, they will make more of it. If you don't want to see it, then it'll go away. And what happened was animation in 3D was becoming uh, more money-making and it was not doing so well in the 2D world stuff was not doing so well. And as a result, they said, all right, then that's enough of 2D and we'll focus on CG, which is easier to make they think, you know, theoretically, and uh, is making more money. So, uh, as I always say in these streams, if you want to see 2D again, um, then keep supporting it. Uh, pay to see it if you ever get a chance, if there's something uh, that's available and you can pay to see it, uh, pay for it and show your support and then they'll make more of them. Uh, and that's the way that you can put stuff back on the map. Um, and that goes for shows as well as movies. It isn't just um, the traditional Disney stuff. It's anything that's 2D animated. If you like it, show your support by buying it, paying for it. Don't just get it for free. Don't just download it for free, even though I know, you know things are expensive. And I'm as guilty as the next person of getting things for free whenever I can, because it's just, why wouldn't you? Uh, but if you want to see them make more of the things that you love, whether they are horror films um, or uh, animated fare, um, then you will show them that you like it and that they should make more by paying for it. And that's how you'll uh, get their attention. And that's how Hollywood works, as I, as I say pretty much every time I do one of these streams, is Hollywood doesn't discriminate. It will make whatever people will pay to see. 
and uh, and if one film is a hit, then I'll make more of them. So again, I'm still thinking about Spider Verse. You know, think about how successful that was, and and uh, how people are like, well, I guess we'll have to make more movies in that style because clearly people were interested. So uh, off we go. So Rushback says you want, want to watch the only movies with a friend every time someone got killed in the front put his headphones on to listen to Tetris music. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's a thing that's hard to explain. And again, this is kind of on topic um, as far as animation goes, but as far as horror films go as well. Um, as far as films in general, it is you know, we're living in a different time where you have the right to sort of be like a Roman, uh, sort of like a Roman um, jury and just put your thumb down and just go, nope, I'm going to do something else. I don't care about any of this. And then I, again, I'm guilty of it as much as anybody in that um, if I'm not engaged, then I, I reach for my phone and that's how I can tell I'm not engaged is because I have this urge to start looking stuff up. And so you've got a maniac with a chainsaw on screen, you know, who's sawing people in half or something. Um, but you've got a lot of time where the maniac isn't on screen sawing people in half. And if they don't get your attention, you know, then you're not even going to notice the maniac or you're not going to care. You're going to say, oh, the effects are bad uh, or that wasn't scary at all. You know, it, so it's, it's a really interesting time to be making movies. Um, the difference was, is, as I said, and that's one of the reasons I liked watching The Exorcist in the theater finally, was to be sitting there captive with nowhere to look but the screen. And when you've seen the film, you know it's coming and you know that it's, you know, a couple scenes, you know it gets pretty rough in, in places. Even by today's standards, I would venture to guess, you know, if you've never seen it before, it's like, wow, I didn't, that escalated. Um, when you don't have anywhere to look but the screen and you're sitting there in the dark and you're not, is something gonna pop out at me or is somebody gonna start screaming? And, you know, it's, it's a whole nother experience. I always talk about Blair Witch Project um, in my uh, classes and how uh, I had seen the film. Somebody had handed it to us and said it was real. And we went, oh, pshaw, 1999 or whatever. Um, we're just like, oh, yeah, right. That's not real. But it was very effective on video to see that and think, are we about to watch a snuff film? Something I have no interest in whatsoever. Is this really real? And then, you know, within minutes we figured out, it's like, no, but it, it was worth paying attention to. Well, to see it when they released it in the theater, which they released it, it was a little bit different than the one I saw, um, was to see an entire theater of people absolutely dead silent. And, you know, having seen the film, I knew nothing happens. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Um, but there's a lot of panic of, I know something's out there and I'm afraid it's going to show itself. And the fact that it never does, doesn't, eliminate the tension that it might. And uh, it was just, you know, having seen the film, not really being too anxious when I saw it, I could focus on the audience. And the audience was just spellbound, sitting in the dark, watching a blank screen with people screaming and going, oh my gosh, oh my God, what is that, what is it? And that was how it was when I saw The Exorcist too. is, is you could have dropped a pin in that theater and people were just wrapped up in the story and caught up in the moment. And it was no, sort of the over it stuff that especially LA, LA audiences can do now and then. Well, for, by example, when I saw The Shining and he starts going, what do you want me to do, Tony? You know, just talking back and forth to Tony, the, the kid, the audience laughed. They thought it was silly. I'm talking in 1980 when it premiered and I was 14 or however old I was. Um, and, and I hadn't read the book. I knew what was going to happen. I wasn't too scared. Um, and I wasn't easily scared by that point anyway. But um, the audience just howled when Tony was talking to his finger. And it's like, you just don't know the audience reaction, what's going to happen. And uh, sometimes the audience is dead silent. Sometimes they react in weird ways. Um, but that's a change now that we don't have people going into cinemas as much. Well, certainly right now we're not going at all, or we shouldn't, we're not supposed to. And uh, what's the difference between a reaction to a horror film when you can easily just go, eh, skip, you know, or, or skip ahead, or, you know, and then another thing was we had commercials when they showed films on TV, and that would be an opportunity to kind of recap or chill or just sort of assess what it is that you just saw, and uh, it made a difference how you'd screen films and how you'd look at them. 
uh, today. And I'm not saying it's better or worse. It's not, not about good or bad, it's just different. And so I'm curious to know how things will proceed as we get more and more into the culture of um, get me now within five minutes or you're gonna lose me. And although a lot of you are hanging out with me tonight for two hours. <laughs> so, um, so again, I appreciate your time. And I hope you're appreciating our discussion, which is mostly about horror films, but hey, it's 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 a uh, Halloween, so uh, and it's a subject near and dear to my heart. Great way to get into the film biz, still, by the way, making a low budget film. I've seen some really cool ones recently. I can't think of them off the top of my head, but the guys who did uh, the Endless, and before that, there was another one. Um, I thought those turned out really well. Those were kind of HP Lovecraftian, and they did Spring. That was another one that was pretty good. John Skull says, I heard Black Christmas influenced John Carpenter to make Halloween. Yes, exactly what I heard. And uh, you can see it when you see the film. Although, it's funny, when I first saw Black Christmas, I didn't mind the ending. But now, I, I'm sort of, I don't know, I have mixed feelings about it. But I thought it was powerful when I first saw it. I won't say what it was. And uh, obviously, nobody saw the remake. I'm, I'm not even going to mention it. Um, unless... If you like talking about something else but um but yeah watching animate makes me feel like watching treasure planet <laughs> the rush back yes i think were we talking about that last time um i actually it's funny i had mentioned that glenn keen liked to draw uh, on the same page as the, uh, the animator who was doing the young guy in the film so there's silver long john silver whatever he is that was glenn keen's character and then the other guy the hero he was um, animated by an animator named John Rippa. I finally figured that out this week and I knew it, but I couldn't remember his name. And anyway, so I saw an article with Glenn Keane and he was talking about that. So I didn't dream it. I mean, I know I didn't dream it. I was there, but it was at the, uh, whatever, Academy Theater um, out in Burbank, um, the big, huge screening facility they set up in the 90s there. It's still there. It's still pretty. Haven't been in ages, but went to a lot of premieres there and a lot of screenings. And uh, so they did a demo of how Glenn Keane and John Rippa drew on the same desk, at the same desk, and drew the same, char uh, did their respective characters, I don't think, on the same page of paper. And uh, again, don't tell Glenn Keane, if you ever bump into him, that I think that it was, I thought it was kind of silly. But, you know, he was experimenting, he was trying different things, and he's Glenn Keane, he can do whatever he wants. Uh, and he does, and he's coming out with um, a new film soon that he was very much involved in. I don't remember the name of it, I should, but uh, to be a good animation instructor, I should definitely know what that one is. It's coming out shortly. It was based, I mean, it, it came out as a result of the success he had with the Kobe film and the short film. And uh, so now he's working on a feature but uh, I don't know where he's at in production. Anyway, it's an article I just saw this week, and it's funny that you mentioned that about Treasure Planet, and then I uh, read an article that confirmed what I was talking about, which is how they drew on the same desk and would draw over the top of each other and try to integrate these two characters so they could be really close and have some... Uh, you know, there's more rapport than you might see ordinarily in a, in a project like that. So you're talking about oh, that was the movie that inspired you to want to go into the industry. Oh, okay. Well, well, that's that's interesting. That's that's good to know. You heard me say I think last week that I was very sad that that film didn't do better. That it was not embraced. In reading this article, it actually maybe it was doing the rounds on Facebook or something. It started with a kind of a clickbait of how that film did so poorly and everyone was so disappointed and then it wasn't about the treasure planet at all so yeah whatever i mean it is what it is i don't i'm, I'm always impressed when people remember those films at all nowadays it makes me happy that uh, all the work was not in vain people appreciate these films and are still seeing them even today i haven't seen it in a long time i've been wanting to give it a second look i've been going through a lot of those films bit by bit over the years um, some of them, it's not that easy for me to watch them. I'm just too close to them and too close to the time. I can't look at them objectively, and I have different memories associated with those eras, so I have to be very choosy about what I watch. 
Um, but I remember liking Treasure Planet a lot. I thought it was a real high quality film and uh, was surprised that it just went, didn't go the way they thought. And I think a lot of times people just jump on a bandwagon. It's just the way life is. Sometimes uh, a thing gets started and you just can't stop it. You know, you just start going down a path and people pile on and then that's it. And it's just heartbreaking when it's something that's so hard to put together like a two, 2D animated film. And uh, I had it happen with my short film. It didn't go over so well when I first finished it. And I just put it away for a long time because I just couldn't take the fact that I'd worked so hard on it and it just wasn't received. Well, it wasn't received poorly. People just didn't care at all. And that's maybe worse than people thinking your film's awful. And I think that's what happened with Treasure Planet is people went, you know, kids who had loved Lion King and all that, they were getting older and um, they were kind of losing interest in the stuff. And uh, so, and, and then I also understand from the article, there was some political goings on, which I know nothing about, so I won't speculate. And so it just kind of vanished and that's, that's a real shame. So I like it to hear when things come back and find a second life. So we got about 10 minutes left tonight uh, to discuss things. Um, I'm going to play this, release the keys, and just take a look and see how things are going and see if there's anything major that I'm going to change on this. But as you can see, I'm just I'm just kind of tying them down. Well, I'm tying them down a lot, actually, because I'm on um, Twitch. So I'm just it's something I can do while I'm talking to you guys is sort of just tie this stuff down and see. So that's how it looks. The keys, I got one more key to do, but I think I'll do that one later. It's gonna be a tight one, so it'll be hard to do while I'm yammering away. Um, I didn't realize that it starts out really small and gets bigger, so I may fix that. I may just go in and make it larger. Now I'm gonna look at the actual in-betweens in with it too. So you can kind of get an idea of what this will look like when it is, um, a little further along so i don't know i might work on this one more week next week even though it's past halloween because i'm, I'm having fun with this thing and, and i think it could look really cool if i get it to the rough tie down stage at least so the question was do you think 2d animated films underperform because people think they're for children uh, yeah i definitely do think that that's part of it night morning all the same <laughs> rush yes <laughs> yes good night good morning good night good morning uh, I always think of it, like I said, if this is um, uh, it's late for me, but I'm, I stay up late and I have students that uh, on the other side of the planet who um, meet with me and it's their morning. And uh, it's all good to me. It's like being an airline a person on an airline on a plane flying around the world. And it's just just time. Uh, but yeah, uh, to answer for Bradley Badel's or however you say it. Um, yeah, I think that they've got a stigma of being childlike. I think it also got a stigma for um, just, just people just want new stuff periodically. And I think that eventually what happened with 2D animation is it started to look very samey and stuff was um, kind of, it was getting stale. And when things get stale, you need to find a way to freshen them up. And I, I always tell the story about how I met with somebody who was one of the heads of the department, cleanup department on um, Princess and the Frog and I asked him, so what are you doing with this film? What's gonna be different? How is this going to be something unique? And uh, he says, well, we're just gonna go back and do, um, do the same old thing. Just like we were gonna, uh, we're going to, um, we're going to go back and uh, just uh, do it like we used to do it. And um, and I said, well, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you go back and why wouldn't you try to pioneer something new? And they're like, that's just not how they wanted to do it. And as a result, I feel like that film underperformed. And uh, and, it was, and then they kind of went back to just, well, we're not making 2D films anymore. So I was real sorry about that because I thought it was cute. A fun little film, but but it uh, didn't do as well as it, it certainly didn't reinvigorate the industry and make it people to start watching 2d films again which was what the goal was um, but then again neither did klaus and i thought that that one um, was kind of pioneering but i still think they haven't gone far enough klaus was still kind of a kid's movie it was about santa claus um, 
Spider-Verse was not, and everybody saw Spider-Verse, sounds like they saw it twice from the, um, um, from the uh, look at the box office. So, um, so I don't know what the magic secret is. If I did, I, I would probably be doing that instead of what I do for a living. Uh, but you got to keep trying things. Um, but it does teach you that making 2D animated films is a big deal. And if they're only making for little kids and little kids don't care about the quality, you know, you can see where that leads to eventually. So uh, people like yourselves need to go out and make these films that can be a little more sophisticated uh, for wider audiences and have white audiences go to them, much like Spider-Verse did, and make it cool again, you know, make it sharp and edgy and, and make uh, people who, buy, who have the money to pay for these films uh, want to invest in them and to want to see them made um, and then start a whole nother renaissance which again i think it's kind of happening already uh, anime for years has been proving that you don't need to be catering just to children it's a great thing to cater to children there's nothing wrong with it but that, that you can branch out and do animation for other purposes and that video games have helped a little bit with that too so the world is waiting the world is sitting on the edge waiting for the next person to uh, come up with um, the revolutionary thing that will invigorate animation that is more hand-drawn based at least uh, to a place where um, where it uh, gets made a lot <clears throat> so so it's up to you guys <laughs> go for it <laughs> and i'll be there supporting it so here's uh, with the background showing this is what my bat scene kind of will look like assuming i continue on with it and I keep it going. It's just a bat doing a little flip and then landing and going ta-da. And um, that's kind of it for my scene tonight. I'm going to save this and probably pick it up again next time and work on a little bit more, at least for another week. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, here are my friends again, my Halloween friends. Um, as we wrap up today, <laughs> well, thank you, Bradley. Thanks. Um, some people don't think that bats are cute, especially vampire bats, but uh, uh, thank you for that. As I always say, if you guys have anything that you want me to bring for next time, I'm more than happy to work on specific things or talk about specific topics and make that sort of the focus of the session. Uh, I probably won't um, probably won't be bringing my, my two Halloween friends back next time because uh, it won't be Halloween anymore. It will have passed, so we want to say a hearty goodbye. Uh, to Jack and to what was it, Serafina? Um, I think that's what we decided the name was. So um, we want to say a happy goodbye to them and hope that they have a wonderful Halloween flying about doing whatever they do. I don't think that these Halloween sprites are afraid of going out into the night. Um, despite lockdown, they defy it. Uh, so uh, we will say a hearty goodbye to them. So it's Team Vampire Bats. There we go. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. I'm quite the bats from China. You had to go there, huh, JD? <laughs> so there you go. But uh, bye bye, you two love disco children. <laughs> nice. Yes, thank you for um, sticking with us tonight and hope you guys had some fun. And uh, I will certainly um, be watching my horror favorites this week. Uh, have been already. Actually, I've actually kind of exhausted the repertoire for the year, I think. I'm just about done. I kind of get to a saturation point and then I'm like, all right. I need to come back into the light. I know out there right now, Charlotte is saying, never stay, stay with us. It's like, ah, yeah, well, my heart always stays. Um, but uh, the, the holidays come inevitably and I embrace them. And uh, we've had a lot of fun with Halloween this year and we'll continue to do so every year, hopefully. Just watch Deadly Manor. Why do I know that? I know that one. Have I seen it? Do I know about it? I can't remember. It's, it's on there somewhere. Gonna finally watch The Shining. Not worried in the slightest. <laughs> yeah, I mean, some people think it's the scariest film ever made. I thought it was silly when I first saw it, but I loved it. And then I've watched a billion and a half times since then. I think it's you know beautiful movie, and it's a piece of my childhood that I'll never forget. And I love a lot of things about it, even as I am um, just fascinated by some of it, the choices. And then I really like Doctor Sleep. I thought it was fun. Just watched it again recently, and um, second time through, I thought it was, uh, it was a great little film. I'd read the book, thought it was a great adaptation of the book. 
Uh, the Shining movie is obviously not an adaptation of the book, but uh, the I think it's it, it does better than the miniseries, which is too on the nose to the book, and then maybe the casting was a little off. Um, but um, and it's just too long; you can't watch it over and over like you can the movie. But uh, I like it all. I think it's great. So uh, good luck with The Shining. Hope you have fun. Come back and tell us about it next week. Uh, I'll be here. I will be here next week, same time, same place, wherever you happen to be, same platform. Uh, I do this for two hours, uh, ending now. So wherever you're at, that's uh, this is when it ends. Uh, but um, and talking about animation or whatever else you guys want to chat about. But I'm here for Scott. I'm Scott Claus for uh, CG Animation. I actually have this, which I always forget to turn on. Um, so uh, cgspectrum.com. Uh, if you're interested in any of our classes or pursuing anything CG related, I urge you to check us out, check out the website, check out the uh, freebies that are offered sometimes, the new stuff that's coming. Um, check out the other streams if you're interested in other disciplines. And again, have a safe and wonderful day and a great week and hope to see you again another time. Take care and have a great time. All right. Happy Halloween too. All right. Bye.